All right, friends, it is high noon in Colorado. I am so happy to see you all, or at least to know that you're there. I see the numbers ticking up as you join. I want to welcome all of you to our lecture series today. We are hosting a very exciting speaker, but before we get that started, I want to introduce our lecture series in general, just in case this is your first time with us. So we are a, a lecture series dedicated to healthcare and the arts and the bridge between them. We are sponsored by CORAL, the Colorado Resilience and Arts Lab, which is a lab on a, a national scale that is based in Colorado and funded by the National Endowment of the Arts. And our goal is really to make sure that we are providing opportunities for the arts and the healthcare professions to intersect and to create new opportunities for research and clinical design. So CORAL itself is, um, has a vision of encouraging healthcare providers and hospital support staff as well, really anyone who works in a hospital to engage in the creative arts. And we provide 12 week workshops in art, music, dance, movement, and writing. And those workshops have um, been going on now for about four years. We're in our sixth cohort. Actually, we're in our seventh cohort simultaneously with our sixth. And we are really excited about the, the data that's coming out of the research. We're excited about the opportunities that healthcare providers and those who work at hospitals have to not only engage in the arts and create community through the arts, but also to process their trauma and to find new ways of building resilience. So that's who we are, that's what we do. And this lecture series really features prominent speakers and researchers and clinicians in the field, artists in the field, who are finding new ways to incorporate the arts into the world of healthcare and vice versa. Um, so I would like to introduce our speaker for today. His name is Jeremy Noble. He is a doctor and has a master's of public health as well. And he is the founder and president of the Foundation for Art and Healing. He's also a faculty member at Harvard Medical School um, and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We are really excited to hear from Dr. Noble today. His, his lecture is called Healthcare Unlonely urgency and opportunity. So as you are watching, if you develop questions that you would like to ask Jeremy specifically, please uh, write those in our question and answer session section. And I will be um, back on screen at the end of Jeremy's, uh, Dr. Noble's lecture to ask those questions and be in conversation with him. So please know that um, we're really excited you're here. We want to engage all of our community. And on that note, I will hand it over to Dr. Noble. Thanks so much, Dr. Noble, for being with us. Well, it's my pleasure, Catherine. And thank, thanks for that very generous introduction and also for the important work you're doing at Carl. What we'll go through in the next 40 minutes or so is kind of a review. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, the Foundation for Art and Healing so, and Project Unlonely, so you know where we're coming from. But then talk about what it is about the arts that represents such an important opportunity, particularly now when stress levels, burnout is, is so prevalent in the healthcare delivery environment and among patients and in the communities in which the health systems are. And we'll address all those. And as Catherine mentioned, there'll be time uh, for questions. So I'm delighted to be assisted by Rafaela here from Carl, who's going to be moving the slides forward. So Rafaela, why don't we go to the next slides? So this is me, Jeremy Nobel. I do lead the Foundation for Art and Healing. And as Catherine said, I'm on the faculty at, at um, both the medical school and the public health school at Harvard. My interest is really around population health. How do you understand health dynamics in a population you're trying to serve? And so that really set the stage very nicely for looking at loneliness as it emerged. But before we go there, next slide, please. Let me give you a little bit of an overview about the Foundation for Art and Healing. We're almost 20 years old, we're a nonprofit. Our mission is to explore and engage creative expression as a path to health and well-being for individuals and communities. The little sine wave there shows kind of our, you know, the various things we've been up to, um, but the, the focus really on, on loneliness started around 2016, so way ahead of the pandemic. 
And as we started trying to um, make sense of loneliness and also think about what the creative arts could do, we've gotten more involved in specific programs that I'll share some of which, some of which I'll share with you uh, today. So um, next slide. So as you can see, what, what is central to our work at the foundation is the purposeful use of creative expression. And not just to entertain, distract, um, and, and so on, but also to fundamentally um, change how we make sense of the world. Next slide. As some of you may know, there's this kind of growing research that supports um, that creative arts literally re rewires our brain, re-energizes it in some very specific ways. Um, next slide, please. Um, so it takes these thoughts and feelings that we all have as humans and um, you know, give us a way to make sense of those, but then also it regulates our physiology, our behaviors, and how we connect with others. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this lecture going deep into the neurophysiology of creative expression in the mind, but maybe just leave it at the level of this slide that's saying it's more than one pathway. It's the neuroendocrine outflow, which is really how, you know, the uh, you know, the, the pituitary, hypothalamus, adrenal axis. This is cortisol, stress hormones. This regulates the immune system. It regulates somatic organ. That's a fancy term for the non-clinicians about the body. So the gastrointestinal system, you know, kind of major organs. But also, um, you know, the arts change autonomic nervous system outflow that regulates breathing, that regulates heart rate you know, that just basic uh, machinery <laughs> of our body. And then in a, in a very important way from mood and other kinds of, um, you know, kind of uh, emotions, um, the arts change our neuropeptide outflow. So serotonin, dopamine, and so on. So all important ways that the arts literally um, change our brains. So, um, but we're going to share a little bit more about whether these arts can be helpful in, in helping health. This is just a five minute video we made a while back called Can Art Be Medicine? Let's see if we're successful at streaming it for you today. Since the beginning of time, art and the creative energy behind it has captured our imagination, energized us, comforted us, and inspired us. Creative expression has an undeniable power providing insight into what it means to be human. Is there something about creativity, how we engage with it and share it with others that can actually improve our health? Can art be medicine? There's never been a culture without art, never been a culture without poetry, never been a culture without music. They must be delivering something to us that we really need for our psyches. You think back to those days and all the challenges that existed just to survive and have food, but they still took time for art, so obviously it had some value for them. And that value clearly had something to do with health. We've forgotten the original stuff that worked quite well before we had all the sort of medications and other sort of technologies for treatment. In very traumatic illnesses, in very traumatic situations like war, everyone is changed. I lost three Marines due to IEDs. I uh, lost several of my friends uh, on one deployment. When I was 16 years old, I had a heart transplant. Uh, I was in the hospital for three months. And I found it odd that each time I did something with uh, art therapy, I felt better because there was something in me that was dying to get out. And through art, I was able to express it. I remember writing about this. I remember writing to my heart. I remember asking it to please work with me. I remember um, really almost in letter form just saying I, I know that this environment isn't natural for you. I know that y you are in a foreign place but so am I and together we can we can find a home. It's essential to add other components in the traditional medical modalities. Anything from the use of artwork, the use of light, the use of drama, the use of storytelling, and the engagement of the patients and the patients' families in an art experience to help them have the optimal care that they deserve. I really believe that in the next few years we will have some detailed answers as to what works. 
We are learning that storytelling and arts and emotional health is just as fundamental to well-being as your physical health. And just thinking about it, talking about it, writing it down, expressing it obliquely, expressing it directly, that can help. I would have never talked about what this meant, but I was able to express it through something that everybody could see what it was and see what it meant, but it wasn't me. I was shielded in some ways. I was protected. I was able to express it in a way that was safe for me. Even though people might think that art is not the same as medicine, it, it was my medicine, and I think that without it, I just would have still been sick. Through simple things, able to create something that, that makes it okay to feel the way I feel and help take those that burden away. Medicine has made great strides in the past hundred years. It's now time to go one step further by incorporating artistic expression into the ways we provide health and healing. All will stand to benefit. Okay, we can go we can go on to the next slide. Thanks, Rafaela. So the arts really do make an impact in health and wellness. And, you know, the traditional four art forms, music, visual arts, language arts, dance, a lot of research on those. We've done that research. But the big three, what really touches people and what we spend our times doing are culinary arts, cooking, um, textile arts, you know, um, knitting, weaving, uh, sewing of various sorts, and even gardening. So the arts are there, there are lots of choices. So how do we do that for health and wellness? So that's a big, big landscape. I know that folks at Carl are operating across that landscape. You know, you can see the power of creative expression in that video and I'm sure in the work at Carl also. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna shift a little bit and, and talk about the harnessing the power of creative expression to address loneliness and social isolation. And so we do that, hang on just a second, if you can just, um, Rafaela, go back to the last slide. So we do that through Project Unlonely. So Project Unlonely is a project. It's become our signature initiative at the Foundation for Art and Healing. So it's got three components. The first is to increase awareness about loneliness, which is why we're, so we're um, delighted to be here today, not just about loneliness and its very specific toxicities, but the second is also to reduce um, the stigma around it so that people will have conversations. They'll share their own struggles with it. They'll be receptive to programming. And then the third goal is to actually design and test and make available evidence-informed programming that use creative expression, sometimes with other elements like mindfulness and social learning, to actually give people the, um, the skills, the experience and the motivation to use the arts to be less lonely. So that's what we're up to in Project Unlonely. Let's talk a little bit more about loneliness. And now Rafaela, if you can go to the next slide. So for a long time, people just thought loneliness, okay, that's, that's too bad. We don't want people to be lonely. Maybe it's a mild um, you know, mental health burden. But over the last uh, decade, it's clear that it's much more than that. So yes, it is probably the biggest preventable risk factor for this classic mental health triad of depression, addiction, suicidality. But growing uh, evidence, which we'll get to in a minute, shows that loneliness won't just make you emotionally upset or dealing with mental health issues, but um, could end your life early and significant increased risk for other disease. So heart disease, um, immunologic disorders, cancer, uh, diabetes. I'll share a bit more of those in a minute. Um, but then also on the positive side, when you're lonely, thriving and flourishing uh, are very hard to achieve. We're human beings, contact with other human beings seems to be hardwired in our biology as well as softwired in our culture. And if you're lonely and isolated, then you fall short of having the fully enjoyable lives that all of us want and deserve. So we took on loneliness. So let's talk a little bit more on the physiology. Next slide. So a really terrific uh, epidemiologist, Julianne Holt-Lundstedt, started doing work around 2010 to look at 
the, the health risks uh, for early mortality and other health risks related to loneliness and social isolation uh, both. So first, really quickly, they're not the same. So social isolation is objective. It's literally how many human beings and relationships with human beings do you have? So people who are stressed out with social isolation can be people in rural situations or shut-ins living in apartments who don't get out. So this is just objective, uh, no one's around. Loneliness is something else. It's this subjective assessment um, of the gap between the, the um, social connections you want to have and what you actually experience. And that gap is what we call loneliness. So as you might imagine, some people who are isolated are quite lonely because they miss other people, some not so much. So being alone is not the same thing as being lonely and they both matter and they both harm your health. So now let's jump into this uh, somewhat busy slide. So the first thing I'll share with you is that the length of this bar and this bar graph is bad. The length actually represents the increased risk of dying early, right? So the top with the red arrow, that is the increased risk of dying early from a variety of, uh, if, you're, if you're significantly lonely and isolated. Now, Rafaela, if you go one click further, you'll see that some very classic public health and medical risk factors, smoking, alcohol consumption, physical inactivity and obesity actually are less risky for us than uh, on early mortality than, um, than being lonely. And so why aren't we paying attention? Well, I think a lot of that is stigma. A lot is that the research uh, base is just growing, showing the toxicity of lonely, loneliness. But I think word is out. Um, next slide. You know, one of the sound bites that you often encounter now is loneliness can be as lethal as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, so that starts gauging the significance of the risk. So the other thing that's starting to happen with loneliness is some very important scientific groups, advocacy groups. This is some recent science policy statements released by the American Heart Association. Certainly the biggest uh, advocacy and advocacy group for uh, cardiovascular disease, which includes heart health and brain health. They convened a panel of experts who uh, developed a study that was released in August uh, 2022, so less than a year ago, really saying that uh, loneliness and social, social isolation both, so both the objective and um, the subjective disconnection, are associated with a 30% increased risk of heart attack, stroke, or early death from either. So, and I, so, and we we can um, we can send around that citation, but it's easy to find online. So, there's no question. There's a challenge. The question is, what can the arts offer? So, so this slide tries to kind of get to you know kind of some of the basics. So, first of all, art projects, unlike many things we do in medicine and healthcare, can be a lot of fun. It's non-threatening. It suits all ages in many circumstances. It gives people a chance to express themselves and what matters to them. And that's fundamentally how people connect, how they see each other, how we see each other. And the arts are a catalyst for allowing that to happen. And as it happen, happens, people get activated. They get activated emotionally and intellectually. They, they get inspired, they get, um, they get empowered. Um, and then ultimately they get connected. And interestingly, they get connected not just to other people, but also to themselves in what could be deeper, more spiritual ways. And so all of this through arts-based programming. And this increased recognition of the effectiveness of the arts is also happening in a very timely way. So if you hear the siren in the background, that's New York City going by. So um, apologize for that. Um, so Johns Hopkins uh, has an Institute for Art, Arts and the Brain. The National Institute of Health puts out grants now to study it, uh, as does PCORI. International attention through the World Health Organization is growing. So we're 20 years ago when we started the evidence base around arts and the brain and arts and health and well-being uh, was relatively small. It has now grown significantly and continues to grow. So that's why we at the Foundation and Project Home Only are so excited about this 
Now, the question is, what can it do um, for us right now, particularly in these challenging times? So we've all been through a really rough three years. So what's made COVID so rough? Well, certainly many of us were isolated in an involuntary way uh, to deal with reducing viral transmission risk, but there's also other uncertainties. Will people, will I get sick? Will people I, I love or work with get sick? Will I, will I have to stay at home more? Will isolate, isolation become even greater? So all of this uncertainty also weighs on us. It increases stress levels, for instance. And that stress, when it gets to a certain level, reaches a stage, hang on just a second, um, uh, Raphael. Um, it, it reaches a stage we sometimes call burnout. Now this is talked, talked about a lot in helping professions, right? So teachers get burned out people in healthcare get burned out. The demands seem to be quite high, right? In the, in, the, in the human to human support services. And as you get burned out, which is not just feeling exhaustion and stress, it also, you start questioning your own ability to be effective. You know, it can be quite, quite negative um, self doubts. You know, am I getting, I'm, am I, is anything I'm doing worthwhile? Very uncomfortable emotional feelings. And often people withdraw. The problem with withdrawing when you're burned out is you get removed from exactly the same connections with other people that could be so revitalizing and healing. And so, in, so instead of getting some recovery time by being with people, you withdraw, you're more vulnerable to stress, you're more vulnerable to burnout. And that's why we have this diagrammed as this loop forward arrow situation. So that's in, that's in many situations, um, but obviously, this is a healthcare group. You, you won't be surprised it's in healthcare. Next slide. Thank you, Raphael. And so you can see, you know, how devastating, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but physicians are ex you know, experiencing burnout. Healthcare workers in general have twice uh, the risk of burnout if they're isolated and lonely. And the general call to action is for an integrated proactive approach. And we, we think the arts can be part of that to address burnout in, in, uh, in, in, in healthcare populations in the workplace. But there's more to it than that, as you'll see. Can, Rafaela, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So we think healthcare organizations have a critical role to play across all of their stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders? Well, in the inner circle, you see the healthcare workers, the employees themselves. Next circle out, patients and families. Next circle out is the community for a number of reasons. Next slide, please. We think it's essential to begin with taking care of the caregivers, that, that inner red circle. You know, how do we support the um, healthcare workers who really have been pushed really over the last several years to what some feel are the limit, even to the point of some leaving the profession because of their, their exhaustion with it. So we have a model of how we reach out in a workplace or any population. Um, uh, and I'll share that with you. Next slide, please. And the center of that model is this concept, it's a very common concept in public health. We call it the pyramid of vulnerability. There are three tiers. And the key to any pyramid structure is recognizing that for any anything, whether it's stress, loneliness, cancer risk, there are different levels of risk. So let's look at these three tiers. The first bottom tier, that's all of us. We're all at risk for loneliness, right? It's just part of the human experience. Now it becomes toxic when the loneliness becomes extended or, or, or really severe, and then it starts changing um, habits, behaviors. You're prone to other risks like depression, addiction, and suicide, as well as the, the cardiovascular risks. But, in, but we don't get there immediately. And so the key thing to do to support the bottom tier, if you will, all of us, are educational efforts like this one and increase awareness about loneliness and its risk. Support peer-to-peer -peer activities so people have more of the social connections at work and in their communities that, that they can rely on. So that's, you know, that's all part of the awareness program. We're gonna share with you an element of that, uh, making us all more aware in this, uh, this webinar. But then the second tier is if something happens that pushes you a little bit towards being disconnected, you know, let's say um, 
a loved one gets sick or something else stressful happens to you or you get sick, then there's a real um, tendency to get even, to begin to isolate and begin to marginalize yourself. So this is what happens when people start slipping into burnout. The key thing there is early prompt recognition and really giving people support quickly. This can be a peer-to-peer -peer support group. This could be a variety of things. It could be, you know, just some exercises people do on their own, creative expression and exploration uh, exercises. And that kind of gives them the opportunity to reachieve balance, um, to kind of have their physiology reestablish itself and to go back down to the middle, to the bottom tier. At the top tier are people who've become significantly burdened. So these are people where their loneliness and the negative mental and physical conditions need um, real serious and uh, coordinated attention from mental health professionals, if there's a medical issue involved from uh, medical professionals and the coordination of all of that. Okay, so you can see it's a pyramid, there are three tiers. The work we do, just to give you more of a sense of it, uh, Rafaela, just next advance. With the programs we offer, we really work at the first two, two, pyramid, the first two uh, levels. So we have awareness and educational programs about how to be more connected, why it matters to be connected, experiences that invite people to have conversations that become more connected. Uh, and then we also have um, workshops and other kind of skill building activities. So if you start getting a little more disconnected, you can actually recalibrate and reachieve that kind of balance that allows you to come, come down a level. Um, and then we also urge people when they do move from the second tier to the third tier, to reduce the resistance to asking for help. That's very important. So that's that's kind of what we do. And we do that in the hospital setting, but we also do it in other workplace settings. We do it in higher education and college campuses, uh, and we do it with older adults. But since this is a healthcare uh, group, why don't we focus in a little bit on what we've done in healthcare and do a little bit of a case study. So next slide, Rafaela. So we've, we've been working with a health system called Northwell Health uh, now for almost three years. <laughs> These are all really great people there, as you can see, um, but it's a complex environment, a lot of stress. This is obviously an operating room scenario. Um, how do we make them less lonely? Well, first, let's, let me tell you a little bit of the facts about Northwell Health. Next slide. So first of all, they're, they're based in the New York metro area and they are really big. They're one of the top 10 uh, sized health systems um, in, the, uh, in the country. They have, this has grown now, they have almost 80,000 essential uh, frontline healthcare workers. They're the largest non-governmental employer in New York with about 20 acute care delivery environments. Um, and we started working with them in, in December, 2020. Um, after almost a year of, of planning and coordinating and so on. That's when we launched the Northwell Unlonely Project. And it is directed to the bottom two tiers of that pyramid um, for their employees with the goal of, of improving emotional well-being, reducing um, stress, reducing risk for burnout, much of it through the use of the arts to both be aware of it, but also to connect people. So let's give you a little taste of it. So uh, one of the ways we increase awareness, next slide, please, is through something we started in 2017, and it is the uh, Unlonely Film Festival. Some of you may already know about it. You may have watched our films. So this is, these are films we stream off a platform, a digital platform, at no cost. There's no paywall. You don't even have to register. You just come watch a film. But the key thing that we found is if you watch it in a group and have a conversation, it gets even better. So um, like all kinds of art, film um, makes us think, makes us feel. It, it kind of connects the dots for us sometimes in tough situations. And as all of these films more or less relate to loneliness in some way, whether it's loneliness related to illness, difference, the modern world, loneliness related to trauma or aging, there's a lot here people relate to. And then they watch these films and they have a conversation. So since this is a workplace group, um, we're going to stream one of our most popular films, 
really about how you can control your own sense of connection in the workplace, often by how you choose to act in the workplace. So with that staging, why don't we go to the next slide and see if we can stream this film. Good night. Hello, young lady. Enjoy your weekend, my love. What's up, brother? Got it? Have a good night. Thank you. Enjoy. Lumber Judge. Good to see you, brother. Hello, sir. Step right up. This job as a station agent is something I feel like I was born to do. BART's Bay Area Rapid Transit is the subway system here in the Bay Area. I've been working at BART for 20 years. I've chosen to live out of the area. A decision I made in 99, so my daughter could go to a public school that's blocks away from the house. That was a sacrifice. It's a two-hour commute, each direction. Growing up, I felt like I was in a box where I was separated from other people. I was very shy and withdrawn, and I had a speech impediment. People were engaging and moving about and living a life, and I was an observer. And I didn't like that feeling. Being in a booth reminds me of that feeling. You know, I don't want to be the person who separates themselves from life. It took me a while to realize that part of being in that situation is self-imposed. If you're in a corner or in a box, it's not necessarily because someone put you there. It's because you've agreed to be in that box. Once you realize that no one put you there, you put yourself there, and you're responsible to come out of the box, everything starts to change. And when I see other people who may be in that situation where they feel like they don't belong, I feel responsible to show them that they do. Every day that I come to work, I engage with 4,000 people. I speak to them, I say hello, I invite them in, I give them good graces going out, I fist bump, I shake hands. People that I've established a relationship with, I hug. I'm not a booth troll, I stay outside. That's where the people are. People look at the BART agent and they think, well, all you need is a high school diploma to be an agent. But no, they tested 5,000 people in the Bay Area. And of those 5,000 people, they interviewed 100. And of that 100 people, they hired 30. And I'm one of those people, I went to Berkeley. I was accomplished, I had my own business for seven years. It's a fantastic thing. Being able to look out and see the world as it is. The homeless, the hurt, the, the happy, the focused, the different walks of life that I engage in is all beautiful. I'm happy to be a part of it. Stepping forward and saying hello to someone and occupying someone else's space and learning about that person is it's the easiest and the best thing in the world. I could do this every day. Hello, young lady. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I love that film. And it was we uh, we screened it at Northwell a couple of times. And, um, you know, I just have a quick short story. So one, one of the one of the nurses actually. So Northwell's on the West Coast or on the East Coast. And so one of the nurses uh, went on holiday to San Francisco and and in some, you know, flash of kind of inspiration, decided to track down this guy. And she was able to find him and went to visit him in the BART station where he was working and let him know how meaningful, meaningful it was to, um, to watch, watch the film. And, uh, and so they, then they videoed, videoed him. <laughs> and we have a little testimonial of him saying thank you to the nurses for their frontline healthcare work and it was quite moving. So it's, 
It's how the arts, the power of film can tell our stories, share our stories and, and bring us together. You know, this is a quote by Pat Flynn that's on the slide now. She's the head of health and wellness uh, at Northwell. Our teams have faced enormous challenges over the past year. It was wonderful to pause, to participate in the Northwell on Lonely Project events featuring short films. There was genuine excitement about connecting and sharing with fellow team members. And again, very light lift from an operations logistics perspective, screen a film in, with people, have a conversation. So you can do it online, you can do it face-to-face. -face. So that's one element of our programming at Northwell. We also do other kinds of um, more intense art-making mindfulness programs, some of them multi-session. We're developing one we'll be testing with them about people who, in addition to being Professional caregivers are also family caregivers. We're very excited to see how that'll turn out. And so another example of how once you get started in an environment uh, like, uh, like Northwell, you can then expand that programming to reach more people and also to, better have, to provide better and more effective relief to people who have higher levels of either loneliness or stress or burnout. So um, these slides, you know, we, we measure the impact of what we do. Next slide. The actual impact of, of these programs generally falls in two categories the way we measure it. We don't do long-term studies on how this might reduce risk for, say, heart disease. Other people are better positioned to do those, to do those studies. These are more like program evaluation impact studies. And there are two types of outcomes that we, we see. One is attitudinal. Um, improvement. So people improve their sense of confidence, that they can manage the stress and burnout of their work situations, that they can navigate difficult emotions. Um, often they feel that they can see a more meaningful uh, path in their own lives and in, in the quality of their life. So these are all attitudinal. We also ask them what, what behaviors have changed and uh, they do increase their engagement with friends, their connection in the community. Uh, many of them become very interested in creativity as a, a, almost a daily uh, practice, as well as mindfulness. So impacts on attitudes and behaviors. Probably the most interesting finding, though, is, is a behavioral finding. Next slide, please. Which is participating in these workshops actually increased the participation in other programs. So not arts and connection programs, but other programs. So there's something about being in a group or working on your own with creative arts as a way to be engaged, inspired, motivated, that actually propels people to be curious about other things, follow up on it, get involved. So we think this is an incredible positive benefit because there's so many things in our lives that we could ex explore if we had the energy and the motivation to do it. So, so that's really kind of the um, work we do in with hospital-based employees, but we think there's even a bigger vision. And I, I showed this slide before, let's come back to it. So um, Raphael, if we can go to the next slide. So there are other stakeholders in the hospital, right? So we've talked about the healthcare workers, right? That's the green circle, but how about patients? How about community? You know, what, what could we do? to take this kind of knowledge that creative arts can be so helpful and move it forward to address a greater set of needs. And they're um, very, very fortunately, this is now being thought about in some serious ways. There's good research coming out on it um, and calls to action also. So some of you may have seen the January 19th New England Journal of Medicine. So, you know, really about a month and a half ago, where there was an article written by Julianne Holt Lundstedt, next slide please, and, uh, and who I mentioned, the epidemiologist who's really spent quite a bit of time studying loneliness and a, uh, a geriatrician, Carla, Carla Parasonato. Both, of, both Carla and um, Julianne are advisors uh, to our work. Um, and they said, you know, we need, you know, Obviously, we have to do something, but how about a framework so we can do it in a more systematic way when we address loneliness uh, with patients and, and then by extension into the community? And so they, they proposed in the same New England Journal article a framework we find very compelling. 
It's got three steps, easy to remember. First is education to make sure people know what loneliness is, how to navigate it, you know, how to recognize it in other people, um, you know, why it matters. So this is all educational activity, but then you also have to assess it. What, what level of the pyramid are they in? Can you actually measure uh, loneliness using some instruments? How severe is it? How does it get in the way of people's lives? So these are practical assessments, much as we do in healthcare routinely for patients. You know, if someone has heart failure, we routinely assess how much exercise they can tolerate and, and so on. Um, can they get through the night without propping up on a couple of pillows and so forth, right? So we're good at assessing in, in healthcare. We just need to apply it to loneliness. And then last, of course, is just like we, the other things we do in medicine. How do we respond? What do we suggest people do in terms of different behaviors or different act activities, like some of the social connections we talked about? So this model of educate, assess, and respond actually can be um, brought forward in healthcare in something that uh, in the UK has been around for 10 years. It's called social prescribing. Next slide, please. So some of you may have heard of social prescribing. It, it's actually a very simple concept. Now, it obviously, you know, sometimes even simple concepts get challenging in the execution, but you know, the concept's simple, it's three parts. First is through conversations with a patient, you detect whether there's, a, there's something they could benefit from that could be delivered in a social setting. Now let's, let's use loneliness as an example, right? So in an interview format with a patient, it doesn't have to be with a, a clinician. It could be a health educator in the, path, in the practice. It could be a psychologist. They're obviously clinicians too. Um, it could even be a community health worker, right? Who's been trained to actually be sensitive about what loneliness is and how to ask questions that um, allow us to explore it. So you have the detection, but then you have to connect people to the resources in the community. You have to link them. And so sometimes in the, in the UK, they actually have a, a medical staff member called a link worker. And that person's job is to know the resources in the community and have the skill of, you know, working with patients to see what do they prefer. You know, if they like being outdoors, maybe there's some walking meditation and art making activities they could do in nature, for instance. Oh, and by the way, the local, the local faith-based group happens to run those walks, right? So they can kind of direct people into community resources. So detect, link, and engage. Just starting in this, in, uh, in this country. So, you know, there, but there are models. So a lot of things we can be doing to address loneliness, right? So go back to the three goals of the Unlonely, uh, Project Unlonely, uh, awareness, um, um, stigma reduction and uh, activity. And so if you go back one more, forward one slide. One more, one more. Perfect, stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Raphael. Um, you've done a great job. Um, and so we only have a few more slides to go and then we'll, we'll have some questions. So I wanted to, wanted to close with a couple of things. First, to invite all of you to register right now for the launch of the seventh season for the Unlonely Film Festival. There's no cost, as I said. If you train your device on that QR code, um, you can go to the registration and then we'll send you the link. Um, you know, maybe we can have Catherine send it out, you know, kind of after this too, because we'd love to have uh, a growing community enjoy these films. And the launch event itself is fun. Um, we do that, we include, um, Mike Pasternak, the president of Lions, Lionsgate Films. He's the judge for this. We interview filmmakers. It's a little bit of Hollywood sizzle and we watch some great films. So come join us on June 4th, uh, if you like. Um, next slide. So this is uh, a little bit of shameless self-promotion. If you get interested in what is loneliness, what the arts can do, I thought I'd let you know that I have a book coming out that you might, uh, enjoy. It could, you can order it now on this. This is a different QR code. It's called Healing Our Crisis of Disconnection, um, Project on Lonely Healing Our Crisis of Disconnection. And it really gets down 
to observations about loneliness in ways that I think many health professionals or other people working in human services will find quite interesting and hopefully helpful. That's why I went through the effort of, of mapping it out. Um, it does have a call to action at the end, which is very similar to this one, which is let's move past just talking about it, measuring loneliness, and let's begin to do things about it, which takes me to the last slide before we go to questions, which is what I'll, I'll suggest is a call to action for health systems. I, I think it is time to embrace creativity to address loneliness as well as other health issues boldly and across the spectrum of care and across the spectrum, the very diverse spectrum of people that we serve. And so I invite all of you to be part of that, that call to action uh, along with Project Unlonely and would be just thrilled to be in touch with any of you, um, you know, at any point, send thoughts, suggestions, share with us things you've been doing. We're happy to promote your activities. You know, if there's some things that you want to uh, especially call attention to and, um, and, and really kind of show how much can be done in introducing the arts as a way to address, you know, the loneliness and social isolation that burden so many, especially now. So with that, I'll wrap up the prepared remarks and maybe we can stop showing the slides and I think Catherine's been collecting uh, whatever Q&A may be in there. She may have questions of her own. And I think we have a little time for some conversation. We do indeed. Thank you so much, Dr. Nobel, for that really comprehensive and thoughtful presentation. I, I went through a whole gamut of emotions sitting here listening to you, having been so dedicated my entire career to the arts in a hospital and having, you know, really traversed the roller coaster of rejection and acceptance and curiosity and support and feeling really kind of forgotten, right, as as lesser um, uh, staff members or less mm -hmm. important. It's it right. takes a lot, I think, to stay inspired and to stay really um, dedicated to the work when a community is 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 so focused on medical care and forgetting yeah. that the arts are, are essential in that. So I just really appreciate everything you brought forward today. Yeah, thank you. You know, the, uh, the German philosopher Schopenhauer, um, early 19th century said, all significant new ideas go through three phases. The first one is ridicule. <laughs> the second is debate. And the third is acceptance. And I would say right now, uh, the, the, the idea that creative expression could be fundamental, not just ancillary or nice to have, but fundamental to health and well-being is now well past ridicule. Yep. And it, it's somewhere in between debate and acceptance. It's like what kind of art, what situations, you know, how do we package it? How do we train people? How do we do yes. it? I think that's where we are now. And given your long leadership in this, it must be a very rewarding time for you. It is. It's exciting. And it's exciting to have people with such stature really, you know, speak um, so clearly about that, that, that kind of bird's eye view that you just demonstrated. It's, it's really helpful. And I think it validates and actualizes our reality in a way that's really, um, I just really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. So I would love to just sit and ask you all kinds of questions myself, but we have some very good questions <laughs> in our in, from our audience. Uh, the first one is from one of our choral founders and facilitators. She is a dance movement therapist and she created the protocol for our dance groups um, and facilitates them. She's on also her seventh cohort. And she, her name is Hilary Sin. And she asks, well, first she says, thank you so much, Dr. Nobel. I'm very excited about your findings on activation in other programs. How is that data collected? And did people seek out these other experiences on their own or were they connected to these other programs through your project? Yeah, great question. So it's all self-report, right? We didn't, we didn't like track digital breadcrumbs to see where people went, but they had no reason to make it up, you know? So we think it's actually an honest signal. And, and the other, to answer the other part, we didn't prompt, prompt them. We didn't say, oh, if you like this, you'll like that. You know, maybe we should, but we, did, we didn't. They found their way to other programs. Some Something got revved up in them. You know, like, oh, I always wanted to try this. And so they would try it. 
and it wasn't all creative stuff. It was other things, you know, right. travel and other activities. And so, you know, I'm sure the dance work um, does the same thing. Yes, she yeah. has found that actually. And I think that's part of her question is she's really wanting to track that process of, you know, inspiring folks to, to go out on their own and find, find supports. Um, she says, I'm not surprised, but I'm so grateful you asked these questions. So an anonymous person is asking a really important question, and I'm going to combine it with one that I had. So one of your slides, you talked about evidence-based and, and um, evidence-based practices. And that that is the term that has been used often to exclude our services as creative arts therapists um, that I've had in a very personal experience with for years around um knowing that we have a strong evidence base, but that that evidence base may look different than yeah. um, medical evidence bases and just the concept of that term. Um, so I'm connecting that to this question, which is how do you get CEOs, businesses, and managers to support these programs? You see okay. the connection. <laughs> this is really a great question. So, yep. you know, I trained as a scientist. I was a chemistry major in college. I was in the MD PhD program in immunology. I admire and adore science, but I also know what it is, <laughs> which it's not some like magical source of truth. It's one set of techniques and strategies, a reductionistic experimental model to try to make sense of, of the truth. And I think there's a lot of power in that model. But it, it's only one way to discover what, what we call truth, you know, because at the end, we just, you know, we really want to know what is useful. And so, you know, the other thing is, is structurally, when do we say something is proven in science? You know, it's a very slippery slope, a fuzzy line. You know, I am quite confident that uh, well-designed uh, experimental studies will demonstrate physiologic, behavioral, and ultimately um, um, illness-reducing outcomes in creative expression-related activities. But to do those long-term studies with the rigor required requires um, significant funding. So it's like a catch-22 because there's resistance to new ideas. Go back to Schopenhauer. You never get, you know, you say, oh, I've got this idea about the arts. And the NIH says, well, here's $3 million to test it. That's not the way it happens. The allocation of science resources is actually a political decision, not a science decision. You know, that the NIH decides how to allocate its budget. So even advocacy has a role in whether good science, important science gets funded. The real challenge is what do we do in the meantime? So there are other kinds of ways you could accumulate compelling evidence. I often use the word evidence informed. If I said evidence based, I probably just slipped up here <laughs> because what we do in our programs is, for instance, using creative expression, using mindfulness and using social emotional learning, there's substantial evidentiary basis behind each of those. So we make kind of reasonable assumptions that if you bring them together, useful things will happen. So I think the science is good and will get better. And the other thing, to answer the other question, how do you um, um, get CEOs to, uh, decide to go forward with this. So it gets to the work, the really, really important work of a, um, an, uh, an economist named Dan Kahneman. So Dan got the Nobel Prize, I think in 2003, by debunking the myth that we're, that human beings are rational actors. Because a lot of economic theory, you may have seen it, was all these little summations of how do we make decisions, big decisions as we sum up the rational benefit of small decisions, we add them all up. So Kahneman demonstrated through some very elegant experiments that that's not how human beings make decisions at all. That we actually make decisions because of emotions. We're emotionally moved to, towards believing something is likely true. And then we backfill on a much slower way uh, the rational justification for that belief. So he published all this in a book about 10 years ago called Thinking Fast and Slow. The fast is the emotional, the slow is the rational backfilling. When I work with CEOs, I always try to remember what one CEO told me, which is don't bring me numbers without a story and don't bring me a story without numbers. So 
I think arts and, and health, arts and connection can tell a very compelling story right now. And I think there's growing numbers and I think it's the packaging of the aspirational story, the emotional story, testimonials, um, you know, qualitative research findings with I think the reasonable curiosity CEOs have, many leaders have, to want to do something that helps and makes a difference. And then hopefully the commitment gets made to test it out as we've done in Northwell, and then they see the results. So it's not simple, but, that I, that I, but I think it's a process that's getting increasingly easier to navigate. I hope that's a helpful answer. It's as honest as I can be about it. I think it's, it's a great answer and, and, and again, comprehensive. I know that, you know, I've been in my field for about 20 years and then for the last 18 been with Children's Hospital Colorado, which has been a huge supporter of the creative arts therapies. And yet, you know, the ability to create evidence, to create data quantitatively and qualitatively have, have been hampered by a lack of funding, a lack of research, uh, research allocation funds. And so meeting our uh, principal investigator, Mark Moss, who has been studying resilience for years, was really serendipitous because creating Coral together has, has allowed us to not only provide services that are helping healthcare workers, but also providing this new database, new source of information that is showing our CEOs um, and our leaders that this is, this is actually making a difference that we're actually seeing a reduction in the desire to leave the profession. We're actually seeing a, a, a studied and evidence-based reduction in anxiety, depression, and burnout symptoms. And, and when you have that data, it is incredible how compelling the narrative becomes, which is what we relied on for years. And now bringing those together has really given us a lot of, um, I'd say kind of uh, leverage projection forward. So I absolutely agree with you. It's not easy, but when you really combine your resource efforts, so working with a principal investigator yeah. who's who's very you know um, open, but also very uh, established in the research world, so we're all moving together forward, um, has made all the difference. Sounds fantastic. Yeah, congratulations. I feel, I feel really lucky to be working together. Um, there is an audience member named Lynn who has some, some great gratitude with specifics of her own. I wanna read these to you. My appreciation to you and your work. I am a medical public healthcare career woman, turned caregiver to my parents, turned cancer survivor. And yes, I used and still use the arts. I have so many therapies, photography, cooking, baking, planting, sewing, paper crafts. It helps a lot to connect with me, myself and other people. I have a lot more benefit from using the arts. I will share your information to my colleagues and I will attend the film festival. Again, thank you. And what I love about what Lynn said, thank you, Lynn, for reaching out, um, is, is her broad interpretation of what the arts are, right? That we're creating every day. Every time we plan yeah. or make a meal, we're creating. And so the, uh, a question I wanna end with, and which is very quick, is around the indigenous the indigenous folks on our planet who have been using the arts for years, how much have they been part of your work or that well, you, concept? Yeah, um, I mean, you saw a little bit in that Can Art Be Medicine film. Mm -hmm. You know, the, these, these, um, the embrace of the arts, sometimes in a spiritual way, sometimes with, a, with an actually explicit medical goal has been around for tens of thousands of years. That's right, that's right. You know, and I think there's a growing... I, the anthropologists have been studying this, writing about this, talking about this. There's some cultures that are so um, woven together by um, connection and the arts, they don't even have a word for loneliness. Beautiful. So you know, I want to end on that learn. note, Dr. Nobel. That was a beautiful line. I love it. Um, and then we have one minute left. So I want to say thank you so much for bringing your wisdom, your experience to us, and your passion for the arts and healthcare. I also want to remind everyone that we do have another speaker next month on April 21st. Her name is Heather Stuckey. She is the Associate Professor of Medicine, Humanities, and Public Health Sciences at Penn State University. So join us you, next month. 
And if you dig through Dr. Stuckey's work, you'll find a 2010 publication in the American Journal of Public Health, which we did together. She was the first author, which was the first ever literature review in the public health literature on arts and health interventions. So wow. um, I would definitely tune in to Dr. Stuckey. She's terrific. Dr. Nobel, thank you so much. What a beautiful legacy you're leaving. And I really just appreciate your time today. Enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Raffaella. And for uh, others who I did invite people to be in touch, I just dropped my uh, my email in the chat. Beautiful. And I want to wish you all the best, uh, the best good luck explore, exploring creative expression as a path to health, uh, health and wellness, uh, and not just for others, but for yourself too. Thank you. Bye, everyone.